I like the enthusiasm. I, I like that, but <laughs> Judah. Somebody's very awake. You've had coffee this morning. It says your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. All your relatives will bow before you. The Judah, my son, is a young lion that has finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and he lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler start from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. He ties his foal to a grapevine, the coat of his donkey to a choice vine. He washes his clothes in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. In blessing his son Judah, Israel was basically calling him a lion. And with this powerful blessing, he bestowed upon his son the authority and the power and even the reputation and all that came with that reputation of a lion. Amen? Every time I do a naming ceremony, I, I know that there are different ways that they do it depending on what part of the world you come from. But every time I do a naming ceremony, and one of the things that you're supposed to do is that the, the pastor or the priest or whoever will take the baby, yeah, and, and name the baby. But I refuse to do that because I understand that a father's words spoken over his child have the power to affect that child's reality. So I always insist, if the father is present, that you must name your own child. Because the words that you speak over your child have power. In addition to that, my brothers and sisters who have children, who are pregnant, or who desire to have children, the things that you say over your, the life of your child have the power to shape your child's reality. Your words have power. The Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue. And in these verses, we see Israel calling his son a lion. And that became Judah's reality. So I want you to be conscious when you're speaking to your children when you're speaking about your children, to make sure that the words that you speak are the things that you want to see manifest in their lives. So don't say to your children, why are you so stupid? Find another way to say to them that they could be more, use more intelligence in their behavior. But don't give them labels. Don't define them with words that can come round and haunt them and haunt you. I know in the moment when we get angry, it is hard to control ourselves. But you must. If you believe that there is a spiritual realm, you must. Amen? Even though Judah was the fourth son, and usually that kind of blessing goes to the first son, but Judah was the first, fourth son, and the father was basically saying that you, my fourth son, will rule over number one, number two, number three, number five, up to number 11 and 12. With that blessing upon the fourth son, he formally enthroned Judah, the tribe of Judah, as the ruling tribe over Israel, using the symbolism of the king of the jungle, the symbolism of a lion. Now, one of the kings, I'm sure we, some of us know this, that one of the kings that came from, from Judah was a man by the name of David. How many of us know of David? Okay, David was a king over Israel from the tribe of Judah. Amen? David, it's hard to tell from the response in this room, but David was one of the most famous kings that has ruled over Israel. He was not only famous, he was powerful and he was loved. He was a mighty warrior, won many battles. Even from his youth, he was killing giants. Giants that men that were older, men that were stronger, were afraid to confront. Now, one of the things that David did 
was that he built Jerusalem or he captured Jerusalem from the Jebusites and he turned it into the capital of Israel. And listen to this. He built a tabernacle in Jerusalem for God. And he named that tabernacle, guess what? Zion. Let me explain something really quick. The original tabernacle had moved around quite a bit. But it finally ended up in a place called Gibeon. When David became king, he took the tabernacle from, Gib from Gibeon. Now everybody was afraid to go near the tabernacle. But David felt that the, the, the presence of God should be in a place that was befitting the name of God. So he took the tabernacle from Gibeon and he brought the tabernacle to Jerusalem. There's a story that some of us may have heard of how he was so excited. He danced and his clothes fell off. That happened when they were bringing the tabernacle from Gibeon to Jerusalem. It was in, sorry, from Gibeon to Zion. It was in Gibeon, or sorry, in Zion, that the tabernacle of God resided. So every time you hear Zion, I want you to know it is a reference to the presence of God, to the tabernacle of God built in Jerusalem, to the place of God's tabernacle, to the new tabernacle, to the new covenant, not the old one in Gibeon. And so the Bible says that David was a man after God's heart and he was from the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. Let's read Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Now, this is the good part. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So, so because of, of this prophecy and a few other prophecies like this, everybody expected that the Messiah that was supposed to come and deliver Israel would come from the, uh, from the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah. They expected that the Messiah who would remove the oppression, deliver them from oppressors, destroy their enemies, had to come from the tribe of Judah. His authority would derive from the fact that he's a son of David, sitting on the throne of David. Yeah, he would be king because he's a descendant of David. So he would be the rightful king. And uh, now remember, Judah, when his father prophesied over him, what was the word he used or what was the symbol he used? A lion, right? So he says, Judah is a lion, hallelujah. Judah was known for strength. He, he was known for authority. He was known for power. Judah was a warrior. Yeah? Hallelujah. Judah was a lion. And guess what? That is what they expected their Messiah would be. Because if he came from Judah, he would be what? A lion. If he came from Levi, he would be a priest. So the fact that the Messiah was going to come from Judah, hence the lion of Judah. Hallelujah. That is what they expected the Messiah would be. A lion, a man with authority, a man with power, a warrior. Hallelujah. And guess what? The Messiah finally shows up. Now remember, the people were expecting a lion from the tribe of Judah. A lion who would destroy their oppressors. And who would bring Israel back to a place of glory among the nations. He would restore their standing. He would restore their wealth. So when Jesus came, the first thing 
the first time he is presented to the people, right, and he is introduced to the people, what, 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 how was he introduced? Let me show you, John chapter 1, verse 29. The Bible says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold up. The Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God. It doesn't, it doesn't connect. Every prophecy was about the lion, was about Judah. Judah and lion, white on rice. Lamb and lion does not go. It was extremely problematic for them. It went against everything they believed and everything they expected about who the Messiah would be. Listen, nobody could have called David a lamb. Nobody. David was a man's man. Okay? Eh? He, was a, he was a man. That's a, a strong man. A lion. Hallelujah. And he had an army of what? Mighty men. The Bible called them the mighty men of David. So in the mind of these people, if you are going to sit on the throne of David, if you are coming from the lion, if you are coming from the tribe of Judah, if we're going to call you the lion of the tribe of Judah, nobody should be calling you a lamb. How can this lamb be the Messiah? Where was his army? How was he going to defeat the Romans? How was he going to make Israel into all the things that had been prophesied? The primary reason why they needed a Messiah was to deliver them from their captivity, right? The prophecy that they were holding on to said, the prey of the mighty will be delivered. That's what the prophecy said. The prophecy said, even the lawful captive shall be set free. And in their minds, they were the prey of the mighty, the mighty imperial Roman army. They were the lawful captive because it was their sin that exposed them to captivity. So, but, but how were they going to be set free by this sad-looking apprentice carpenter with no history of victory in war or experience of war? And then he's, he has this ragtag band of illiterate fishermen, misfits, greedy crooks, that one they call Judas. This is a joke. They were expecting a lion. All through the years, they had been expecting a lion. Now, look at the legion of the Roman army. Look at all the Roman soldiers. Then look at these 12 disciples. What do you think is going to happen here? A massacre, and it will not be the Romans. Now, the symbol of the Roman army, their, their insignia or their sigil, for those who watch Game of Thrones, <laughs> was a, an eagle, the Roman eagle. And the only animal that defeats an eagle is a lion. But this man is a carpenter, we don't even know, of questionable skill and experience. Definitely not, not a lion. They were expecting a lion. They were expecting a messiah. But what did they get? They got a lamb. Do you understand their disappointment? Do you understand their frustration? You spent years believing that God was going to do something for you. You had staked everything on it. And then something else shows up. You're expecting a knight in shining armor who will come and pay all your bills. And you never have to pay a bill again in your life. Hallelujah. He will take care of you. Eh? Take care of your family. Yes. That is the word of God for you. So who is this one? Doesn't have a job. His shoes, his socks don't match his pants. 
Sir, what, what do you drive again? No, 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 no. I'm looking for a lion. You? A lamb. They were extremely disappointed. I think, you know, I think their disappointment was one of the reasons why when, when uh, Pilate wanted to crucify Jesus, they were very vocal in their support of his execution. When Jesus Christ came into Jerusalem, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then expecting that as he landed in Jerusalem, all the Roman soldiers would just fall down and die. Those of you that are praying for people to fall down and die. That is your expectation, that you will go to the, you, that somebody will call you and said your mother-in-law fell down and died. Or that your boss fell down and died. You better stop praying that anybody should fall down and die. Eh? If God answers that prayer, he might start from your house. So don't be, I kid you not, so don't be, be mm, mm. If you go to a church and they are praying for people to fall down and die, say, God, just help my enemies repent. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this, this, Jesus came into Jerusalem. Let me continue my sermon, Joe. He came to Jerusalem and um, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And they were actually expecting that, okay, because Jerusalem was the, was the seat of government, that he was going to come and overthrow uh, 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 the, uh, Pontius Pilate, the, 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 the prefect or the governor, whatever it was they want to call him. And instead, they saw him in chains, beaten by these Roman soldiers. I mean, the guys were like, really? We've been waiting for you to save us. And you don't even have the sense to avoid being treated like this. Crucify him. Crucify him. Now, the reason they were disappointed was because they did not fully understand their predicament. The Romans, with their evil and brutal ways, were not the problem. The oppressors were not the problem. They were just a symptom. And honestly, in all fairness, I believe many of the Israelites understood that the problem was not the Romans. I believe many of them understood that the problem was sin. But the expectation was that the Messiah would enforce the laws of God. That he would make people obey God. That he would restore proper worship to the temple of God. That he would stop all this, all this nonsense and all these shenanigans. Tax collectors, adulterers, prostitutes, fornicators. And when Jesus took a whip and was flogging people to leave the temple, some of the people were cheering him. Yes. Yes, he's cleaning house. Finally, somebody to bring back proper order. You know God likes everything done decently and in order. Now we can offer our sacrifices without all these dirty people disturbing us. But even they didn't fully understand. Adultery is a symptom. Prostitution, fornication, they are symptoms. The virus that causes the symptoms is so deeply embedded in the human DNA, it can't just disappear by willpower. There is a stain, my brothers and sisters, that no amount of good deeds can wash away. There is a stain that your righteousness cannot wash away. Now that stain, that virus, that was their real enemy. That was the real oppressor. That was the real oppressor. That's, that, that stain in their DNA, that was the, the mighty oppressor that they were the prey of. That was the captivity that they needed deliverance from. Their good deeds could not save them. And the solution to the stain, to the virus, 
was not to get rid of the Romans. You get rid of the Romans, and not, another nation will rise up and oppress them. And that is why many times we find out that our problems are not the problem. Our problems are a symptom of something bigger. So we go from problem to problem. From deliverance to deliverance. Because the problem is so deeply embedded in the human DNA. Many of us have even forgotten it is there. The solution was not get rid of the Romans, execute the adulterers, stone them. The judges and the executioners themselves were thieves and murderers. So when, when they gathered to stone the woman, when Jesus Christ said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone, they were shocked. They, they thought that Jesus would be the one, the Messiah. You claim you are the Messiah. Okay, this is the problem. Deal with it. Instead, he turned it on them. No wonder they were yelling, crucify him. Because they did not get it. All of the prophecies about Jesus told them what Jesus was about, but they were not listening. They, want, they were hearing what they wanted to hear. When God says he will bring you a man who will take care of you, who will take care of everything in your life, then he brings you Jesus. And you're like, no, Jesus is for prayer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, no, let's, let's keep this thing separate. Church is church. Husband is husband. And the two don't have to meet. <laughs> they didn't get it. And Jesus spent all of his three plus years of ministry trying to explain it to them, but they refused to get it. In fact, in Luke chapter 19, verses 43 to 45, the Bible says, For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment round you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you, and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave you in they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus was not talking about the people. He was talking about the city of Jerusalem and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They missed their visitation. Their Messiah was in their midst and they did not see him. In fact, they, they, they killed him. My prayer for you is that on the day the Lord visits you, on the day that the Lord brings the answer to your prayers, you don't turn your back on it. Amen. You don't miss it. You don't reject it. Because you are locked into a mindset that cannot be shaken even by the word of God. The Bible says, do not be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Some of us are locked into a mindset and we find a way to draw a separation line between what we think and what the Word of God says. So we keep finding ourselves disappointed because when God does what he has promised, we don't recognize it. We're looking for what the world says and when God brings what he thinks is needed, we don't recognize it. I don't know how many of us have seen a diamond in a store. How many of you have seen a real diamond in the store? You know, the type that costs a lot of money. Many of us have seen it. How many of us have seen a diamond on the day it comes out of the ground? Anybody here? Okay, a couple of people have. When you see a diamond on the day that it comes out of the ground and you see a diamond in the store, the two look opposite to one another. Many of us, 98% of us, 99% of us will throw a real diamond away when we see it out of the ground because it looks nothing like the finished product. Nothing like the finished product. Guess what? Because you know what we're looking for? We're looking for the finished product. So when they tell you, oh, go get a diamond, you're looking for the finished product. And you're kicking diamonds around saying, this one is, this is just nonsense stone. Wasting my time. Just, just a time waster. 
on, on, on serious stone. My friend, get away from here. Kicking diamonds around. Because what? They look like cheap stones. We, we had a, a conversation one day, and one of, the, uh, one of the female pastors, I think, was it you or Tosi? Or Laura, one of the female pastors, I don't remember which one of them, was telling us that all their husbands, all their husbands, eh, that if we, if, in fact, have you guys seen my wedding pictures? Oh my God. <laughs> nee, you do well. <laughs> oh, this is a woman of faith. If you had seen my wedding pictures, oh, I would not have married me. I look like a piece of stone. Hallelujah. I was poor. I looked hungry. No, I, no, no, I looked hungry. My neck was very long. You know when you are poor, there's a distance between your neck and your shoulders that is very exaggerated. All my clothes were from thrift store. All. My car was a death trap. In fact, some of my friends wouldn't enter my car. Nobody would have... Well, let me not say nobody. At least, thank you. <laughs> but today... Uzabu, uzabu. <laughs> God has been good. Yeah. If you had looked at me without God, but look at me with God. Sometimes when you see the stone, hmm, look at the stone with the eyes of God. You might just see potential there. Because to the glory of God, I'm not bad right now. Many of the ladies here would have said, you two, you, are still, you two, you want to marry. You are still in your father's house. You are doing errand boy in church. What's your plan for the next five years? You don't know. God will provide. Come on, go and get a job. Get out of here. We need to break this mindset. All of us, we said, God works in mysterious ways. I want God to do something in my life, but he has to do it like this. <clears throat> I'm, I'm out of time. But I have a few things I would like to say, but I'm out of time. Do not miss the time of your visitation. Do not miss the time of your visitation because you are not paying attention to what God is saying. You don't care. Some of us won't even ask God if she does not look a particular way or he doesn't have a car. We won't even ask God. Say, Pastor, what am I praying for? She, she's not the one. How can she be the one? No, 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 she's not the one. Are you sure? Ah, Pastor, no. Pastor, I should go and pray about him. What if God says yes, then I'm, I'm stuck. <laughs> Some of us won't pray because we're afraid that God will say this is the one. You're not going to take the chance that you'll be locked in by God. Imagine if AK hadn't prayed. She would have been married to some jack, sorry, some, <laughs> some fellow. <laughs> but not a... <laughs> the enemy that needed to be defeated was the stain of sin and the death it always produces. The only way for that defeat to happen was for the lamb to die. Jesus had to die because with the shedding of his blood, all their sins would be washed away. The requirement of the law says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So he had to die for there to have been forgiveness of sin. Why? 
because all their problems were attached to their sin. They didn't realize that he would have to go down into the very depths of hell to ensure that their victory would be permanent. What they didn't realize, my brothers and sisters, was that for the Messiah to be a lion, he had to first be a lamb. For him to reign on the throne of David, he had to die on the cross of Calvary. Before he could be the lion of Judah, he had to be the lamb of God that dies to take away their sins and our sins. When the stain is washed away, when the virus is dead, the symptoms will recede. But we spend so much time trying to cure the symptoms when really we should be focused on the true solution. Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Rose of Sharon, the Excellency of Israel, the Lily of the Valley, the bright and morning star, the ancient of days, the rock of ages, the one who is, the one who is to come, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the solution to every problem you have because he is the solution to sin. And everything we struggle with on this planet, from wickedness in the hearts of men, from disease, from poverty, from stagnation, from depression and anxiety, it all comes from sin. They are the curses that follow disobedience. They are the curses that follow sin. And there's nothing that we can do by ourselves to cleanse ourselves. These days I find myself saying this a lot. All of our righteousness, all of our good deeds, all of our gallant and valiant efforts, in the eyes of God, the Bible says they are nothing but a filthy rag. God, when he sent Jesus, did not reform our righteousness. He didn't reform it. He didn't um, polish it. He gave us his own. So the Bible says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The Bible talks of the righteousness of God that comes from faith in Christ Jesus, in the finished work of Jesus. My brothers and sisters, that is a game changer. That is the real game changer right there. One who can affect your life permanently. That is true victory. The victory that is transformational. It always starts from Jesus. That is the solution that is permanent. That is the captivity that you will never go back to. The Bible says, he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. My brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, if you are in Christ, you are free from the power of sin and the death that it produces. But if you are not in Christ, if you have never accepted that Jesus Christ died for you, you've never said, Father, I accept that Jesus died for me. I accept that his blood was shed for me. I accept that the sacrifice of his life was made for me. If you have never said with your mouth to God that with his death, atonement was made for me, you are not in Christ. You are not in Christ. You can come to church, but you're not in Christ. You can sleep in church, but you're not in Christ. Without that acknowledgement, verbal, visible acknowledgement, you are not in Christ. I want you to ponder that for a minute. Are you in Christ? 
Have you said, I accept? Have you accepted that he died for you? If you have, you're good. And you can bow your head now, if you have, and say, thank you, Father. Thank you for the sacrifice that you made for me. I didn't make it myself. But if you're not in Christ, if you've never said that prayer, it's such a simple prayer. It's such an, a, a simple thing to do. You can say that prayer with me now. You can repeat after me. Father, I thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. I thank you that his blood was shed for me. I thank you that his life was taken from him in place of my life being taken from me. I thank you because he died to pay the price for my sins. I thank you because with the shedding of his blood, with his death on the cross, all my sins have been paid for. I am free. I am free of the debt that I owe. I am free of the debt that I owed in my past. I am free of the debt that I owe in the present. And I am free of the debt that I will owe in the future. Thank you, Father, for saving me. Thank you for washing me. Thank you for cleansing me. Thank you for making atonement for me. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know that as we said that prayer, something happened in the spiritual realm that as you remain in that place of confidence in the finished work of Christ, you will see it translate into the physical realm. You will see it translate into your daily life. But to help you on that journey, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to do yourself a favor, actually, and text the word renew to 94000. 94000. Text the word renew. Amen? Because God is doing something new in your life. Something fresh. Something powerful. You are about to embark on a journey of love, of peace, and right standing with God. And I want to say to you this morning, congratulations. Because with the saying of that prayer, you have been adopted into the greatest family in the world. You have become a citizen of the greatest kingdom the universe has ever seen. You have become a member of a new tribe. Let us rise to our feet and praise the name of the Lord this morning. Hallelujah.